to The Jay Kim Show, Hong Kong's first dedicated podcast on investing in Asia. Join us as we survey the land and discover the greatest companies and most profitable investment opportunities in Asia. If this is your first time listening, thank you for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week with the goal of providing actionable insights to you, the listener, with every single episode. And now, on to the show. This week's show guest is serial entrepreneur Peng T. Ong, who is the co-founder and managing partner of Monks Hill Ventures. Monks Hill Ventures is a technology venture fund based in Southeast Asia. Prior to that, he started and exited three companies in the U.S., including Match.com, and has an extensive experience in China and Southeast Asia as a venture capitalist. Peng, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jay. So for our audience listening in, uh, if you could give us a little bit of background, maybe a little bit of history of career history of yourself. Obviously, you've uh, been a very successful entrepreneur and now you are an investor. So maybe you could share with us a little bit of your journey. Okay, I'll just give you sort of a factual landscape of my past until now. Um, uh, I grew up in Singapore, uh, born bred there, um, went to um, Texas as my undergraduate uh, after Singapore, and then uh, my graduate was in computer science in, at the University of Illinois. Started working at startups right after school, uh, after grad school, and uh, ended up in the Bay Area and um, in several startups, and then finally started one with uh, my first uh, startup partner, Gary Kremen, and that was basically what became Match.com. Uh, uh, a few years after that, uh, I started a company called uh, Interwoven, and that went public on NASDAQ in 1999, uh, about a year before the, the you know, bubble burst. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so, so obviously, uh, you know, very, very well seasoned and experienced. What, uh, what was the reason that you decided to go into sort of startups and tech right out of school? Um, and, 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 you know, I asked this because a, l- a large part of our audience is, is, uh, is from Asia or has Asian heritage. And uh, it's not necessarily the conventional path uh, for, you know, I mean, my parents wanted me to be a doctor, right? So, uh, I'm just curious. I, <laughs> uh, well, it's, I, I don't know why. Um, but I asked myself, uh, this question very early on, I think in my teens or at the very latest when, uh, when I was doing the army, oh, wow. uh, yes, that's right. that is, what, what, what is the purpose of my life? What, what am I going to be doing that that's going to be meaningful? So I asked that question pretty early on, and um, and I, I realized uh, I, I I'm a I'm a tech geek, right? So I, I like technology, <laughs> but I also like to build things beyond technical things, like companies and teams and, and working with people. So you know, I think I decided to become an entrepreneur like way way early. You know, probably in right after high school, during high school. My, my dad's an entrepreneur too, so ah. it, you you understand that world a lot better. Uh, if you grew up in it, there you go. That that was my next question: was how how receptive or supportive were your parents? And but and it seems like they they were very supportive. If your father was not yeah, as well, no, no, no problem at all. Even when I dropped out of grad school. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's fortunate for you. But you've obviously uh, you know you parlayed that into uh, several successful ventures, and then uh, you know after having done the sort of startup and building a company from from the bottom up and you know even seeing a a, a, a listing as an exit uh which is which is uh, you know most entrepreneurs uh by statistics 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 never actually see that so it's actually a, a very rare thing um and uh, having done that after that what made you then decide that you wanted to step away from that and and go on the other side and start to be a investor yeah, it, it's all about thinking about what would be meaningful to do. I mean, back to that purpose thing, right? If you spend enough time thinking about what it's all about, you, at some point you go, okay, this is how I can make a difference. And what I realized uh, after my uh, a few years working with other, um, I guess, more uh, government type of uh, funds, and then, um, and then uh, in China, spent a few years in China with a VCGSR Ventures, yes. um, I, I realized that I could actually, number one, have a lot of fun, and number two, make a big difference um, investing in companies and being a VC. 
Never thought I'd be a VC. That was not one of the obvious career choices for me when I was uh, e- even just 15 years ago, right? right. Um, so so um, I kind of stumbled upon it, but it made sense that I guess I would have fun doing it since I would be working with entrepreneurs and building companies. Absolutely. And and do you ever feel this, uh, you know, I, I feel like if you're a sort of born and bred entrepreneur, which you obviously are, there's there's always a side of you that's itching to sort of start a company or, or build something again. You know, I mean, do you feel fulfilled just, uh, you know, being playing that investor role where, where you actually do get to be hands on and, and help these companies. But is there ever a time where you're kind of like, oh, you know what, I, I want to uh, I want to build something else now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, f- first of all, uh, building a, a new VC is kind of like a startup, except it's mm-hmm. not as operationally intense. But but, you know, every time I, I think about it, wouldn't it be nice to start another company? I, I've done three of them, right? So uh, as, a, as a founder and then a few more as a non, as a early employee. So um, I remind myself every time I think about that, how hard it is. It is really, really hard. <laughs> and, and, and frankly, I think I'm more leveraged now that I have that base of experience. I can actually help a whole bunch of people do it instead of having, you know, struggling through it myself. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, that's that's uh, this is sort of the dark side of entrepreneurship, which a lot of people uh, don't actually know until they've tried it. Uh, is is literally how difficult it is, and it it gets glamorized by sort of media and this sort of thing. You know, I mean, ever since uh, the, that that Facebook movie, what it, Social Network or whatever it was, came out, you know, everyone wants to start a company and and live that uh, that life, but it, it's actually it's actually opposite of that. You know, it's a lot of just hard work and grit. So. Um, yeah, so, so before we sort of move into, uh, talking about your, your, your VC now, um, the, the, the last sort of question on your background is of the sort of three companies that you started and, and have subsequently exited, what, what, which one was your favorite? Uh, it's like asking a parent in front of their kids, so <laughs> who's your favorite kid? I, I have three children, so I, I know that it's, it's an impossible question to ask you. Yeah. No, they're different. They're very different creatures, right? Um, uh, Match was my uh, first uh, company, but it was we, we basically were were thinking around with social before social was a term in the internet, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that was fun that way, but we learned a lot of lessons about what not to do in a startup. Um, in the end, that got sold, and the entity just went public a couple of years ago. So uh, oh, okay. it's still. There's still a pretty interesting exit, although I'm not responsible for the IPO. Right? I still know some of the guys running the company. Sure, sure. Great, great bunch of guys there. Um, Innoven was great from a you know building something really significant from scratch. I mean, people that went through that uh, that company always have fond memories of it. Almost anyone I talk to who's gone through that. Um, I think we had a lot of things right. We had a few things wrong, which um, in, in the end were um, maybe somewhat fatal. But, it, you know, we were a public company, you know, before we, we sold the company. We were public for almost 10 years before we sold it. Right. Um, so that was interwoven. And then um, Accentuate uh, was, um, was a smaller one. It was hard because it was post-bubble burst. Right. And that was about 10, 12 years where it's really hard to do tech. Uh, in the end, it uh, landed safely in IBM. Uh, it's now part of IBM's um, offerings. Right. Each one is, is, is different. And like you said, it's like picking children. But um, I, I'm, I'm sure you've drawn on all those experiences now uh, to being on the other side where you're an investor. So let's let's uh, let's jump right into uh, Monk's Hill Ventures. Um, why don't you give us, uh, well, let's, let's start with the name. What, what was this, what is the name? Uh, how did you come up with that name and what is it? What's the significance of that name? It's, it's pretty easy. Um, first we could get the dot com. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big thing. <laughs> yes, it's a big thing. Um, we, uh, both Koi, my partner and I have, uh, uh, gone through the school. I, I went there for my high school and he went there for his, uh, German classes. Mm. So we both spent at some parts of our life, at some points in our life, about four years uh, through that through that system. 
Um, it's a school. It was a school. It's no longer. And, and we thought we'll keep the name alive. Mm-hmm. It's uh, Monks uh, gives a, you know, there's a lot of historical innovations uh, related to, to monks, actually, both in the East and the West. So right. we thought that was sort of relevant to the business we were in. And ultimately, um, this is probably less known outside of Singapore. Monk Sil is is actually not one of the top schools in Singapore. Uh, mm. It's a it's a reasonable high school, but we call it a neighborhood school, right? right. Uh, and and um, our point here, uh, naming it, is is to sort of um, when when I first went back to Singapore. Uh, I would give talks. I was living in the U.S. for the longest time, then went back to Singapore. Mm-hmm. I'll give talks to kids about, you know, what I did and all that. And one day I mentioned I was from Monk Hill Secondary School, and my friend heard this, my classmate uh, heard this and said, you should always remember to say that when you're talking to kids. I go, what, what's the big deal? Uh, he says, you might not realize this, but a lot of kids, when they don't get into the top high schools, right, mm. not not college high schools think you know they're done for and right. the point is you know you you can go to an average high school and still do really really well your your life is not over at high school <laughs> i love that uh, that's that's very significant actually yeah so so that's one of the reasons also that we decided to pick that name that's excellent yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, especially now with, with the way the world is turning and, and with the advent of the Internet and, and this sort of thing, you know, I mean, I don't know if traditional sort of, uh, I mean, look, you're from Singapore. I, I live in Hong Kong. I'm, I have three kids. I yeah. know exactly what the uh, the struggle is with, with sort of getting in schools and this sort of thing. But um, I, I think that's great, uh, a great name that you picked. And then how about sort of a... A mission statement or or a goal like a strategic vision that you and your partner had i mean what what there must have been something from the get-go i mean it wasn't just kind of like oh you know let's just get in the vc game and let's uh, roll the dice and see what we can do right what was your sort of mission from the beginning i, I i'm doing this very simple i want to build southeast asian globals i want to help build southeast asian globals meaning companies that were built in southeast asia started mm-hmm. in south asia but are global names right, right? You know, it, it, it's like how LinkedIn is a global name. It's like how Baidu is a global name, right? Right. Can we have the equivalent from here? And I think it's starting to happen, right? Mm. Uh, who doesn't know about Grab in the tech world today? Right? Yeah, absolutely. And Gojek is also coming up, and there'll be a bunch of others that will be visible, right? So I, I want to be part of doing that. I, I was part of doing that in China, and then I saw the impact on on the confidence of entrepreneurs, the confidence of engineers, you know, when, when China started to become really successful globally, you know, becoming visible globally. And I think there's something to be said for being able to build a, a world-class product company uh, in the tech field that gives you that, that stature and that, that confidence to stand up, stand up in the world stage and go, yep, you know, we, we are just as good as anyone in terms of being able to do this. And and I, I hope we can get that sooner than later for Southeast Asia. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that uh, you touched on a pretty good uh, point there, Peng. You know, I think that uh, traditionally uh, outside of Silicon Valley, not there's, you know, the traditional VCs, they, they always sort of think about Silicon Valley as the Mecca or the, the Wall Street of, of early stage investing. And then when you look out at the ecosystems outside of Silicon Valley, oftentimes what it takes is, uh, is a significant exit, whether that be, a, you know, a big IPO or, or even an acquisition, um, you know, such as maybe Waze in, in Israel, right? And these sort of things actually help put the country on the map. So I think that, uh, you know, this is the sort of thing that we all need here in Asia, particularly in Southeast Asia. And I think you're on the right track. So um, as far as, uh, you know, the landscape goes in Southeast Asia, you know, what obviously it goes above and beyond your your mission. You know, I mean, you are from Singapore originally and, and you want to, you know, sort of promote that. But you know, there's obviously heavy macro tailwinds uh, that that uh, are favorable to Southeast Asia. So uh, maybe you could give our audience a little bit of, uh, of what you're seeing. Yeah. Um, so if I go really macro, I mean, 650 million people, uh, GDP per capita, five to seven percent per annum. Uh, 
uh, sorry, not GDP per capita, but GDP, 5 to 7% per mm -hmm. uh, growth per annum. Uh, GDP per capita is around 4,000, which in coincidentally is around what China was about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, China is now about 8,000, about double that. Uh, and, and so you, at that level, you, you start seeing the pickup on the use of internet and the consumption right. of internet-based services, uh, including financial services, etc. So, you know, it's, that's a theoretical statement, but when you get on the ground, you see it happening. You know? um, a lot of opportunities, uh, I think more than 50% of the people in Southeast Asia are less than uh, 30 years old. Uh, right. An incredible amount of youth here growing very fast. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, uh, internet uh, broadband adoption uh, in in various various countries there are more uh, SIM cards than there are people. Uh, <laughs> wow, that's incredible. I think uh, the, the the interesting and and also very cool thing is that I think a lot of people uh, just I don't know for whatever reason, but they they they're unaware of sort of the demographic and macro trends that are 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 behind you there in Southeast Asia. So I think that uh, this sort of thing is actually the reason that, uh, you know, that that I do the podcast because I like to to bring on uh, people like yourself to, to help educate uh, our listeners. So um, if we could maybe take us a, a little peek uh, behind the curtain, you know, I mean, I, I obviously um, you're, you're good at what you do. And, and uh, but, you know, I think that a big question that a lot of, of, of listeners, perhaps startup founders are probably asking is, OK, you know, like, uh, you know, paying at Monk's Hill Ventures, uh, you know, I mean, he can he can choose to to invest in a, a number of different startups. There's a whole bunch coming up uh, now that are very promising. W what are sort of some of the criteria that you look at? You know, what 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 are some key metrics or 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 what excites you when you see a pitch deck, which I'm sure you get hundreds a day uh, landing on your desk. Maybe hundreds uh, a month, but not hundreds. A day. <laughs> but um, uh, actually, surprisingly. This is consistent around the world, whether you're in the valley or in China or you're, you're out in um, Southeast Asia. You, mm -hmm. uh, we, we look for uh, great entrepreneurs, and so you, it's hard to see that in the pitch deck. You get a sense of it, but you got to spend time with the entrepreneurs. Great entrepreneurs going after big chunks of the economy, right? We're not interested in small small uh, potential businesses. Not to say mm -hmm. that small businesses are not good, but uh, it doesn't work with a with a VC model. We need to go after big total addressable markets, big TAMs. Right. right. And then, of course, um, using tech to really differentiate. You know, um, how do you build up your uh, proprietary data uh, set so that the value of your company grows exponentially as you grow? Right. So mm. it's not only revenues that's generating value in your company; it's the data that's generating value in your company. So, so that's that's a very peculiar one, but this is true in any internet play, right? right. So, so those are the things I look for. Uh, I, we tend to be much more in favor of asset-like companies than asset-heavy companies like inventory and all that. Yeah, we we say we prefer ad, uh, bits to atoms. Um, <laughs> right. So, yeah. yeah, multiple things like that. We 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 need to know that you understand you as the entrepreneur understand. You know, uh, growth hacking, you know, virality, uh, engagement. Um, uh, if, we, if we ask, you know, what's your engagement like or what's your retention like or what's the virality like in your user base and you sort of give us a blank face, you're probably the wrong <laughs> entrepreneur, right? Uh, the, right. The, these numbers that we mentioned, uh, these, these uh, uh, parameters, metrics that we, we, I just mentioned, mm. Uh, are now sort of the, the new accounting for, for the internet, right? So if, if you want sure. in the internet business, you better understand all these things. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, so, what, is there a, a particular stage within the growth of a company that you guys like to invest in? You know, are you are you sort of a earlier seed type stage, or are you uh, like a Series A, like a, a you know proof of concept is there, and then you guys can come in and maybe lead around? Yeah, now we, we, we are um, basically a, a stage A investors, series A mm -hmm. investors. 
uh, we come in when you more or less have a, a, a model that you, we think is scalable. You know, we're probably wrong in several aspects, but generally it's, it's kind of scalable. And we come in with a bit more money than, than the seed round. We typically write a check for uh, two to five, maybe seven million initially. Um, and, uh, and we help you grow the company. So, so you got to be able to spend, you know, two, three, four million dollars in, in a few years in order for us to come in. Right. And that's, that's right. You know, you got to know what's going on with your business. How do you predictably, um, generate revenues using capital? Right. Uh, and, and that's what we call, uh, the year before you get to that stage is what we call the, the, uh, startup phase of a startup. Right, it's the sales engine construction phase where you're building right. an engine that can predictably generate revenues. So you got to be pretty rigorous about it. You know, people that wave their hands and say, "Oh yeah, we can just make money and grow," and have no details to that, uh, we get very suspicious of. <laughs> you bring up a very good point, though. Actually, and I don't think that this is talked about enough. Is basically, you know, it's great that you can raise money, but are you actually able to use it and leverage the, you know, that capital to to grow your business, right? And and you know, the same thing goes for on the investor side, which I'm sure you're familiar with. You know, when you raise a fund, that that those funds need to be deployed, yeah. and there's some there's a certain amount of uh, pressure that uh, you know, I mean, the investors want their return. So, yeah. uh, in the same way, you know, I think a startup found. Oftentimes, uh, you know, they're, they're just foc- hyper focused on, okay, I got to raise the next round. But then they often forget the details behind that, which is essentially what drives what drives around, right? Well, the, the first question they need to be asking is what, what are VCs looking for in the next round, right? How, how do I mm. deserve the next round of financing, right? And, right. and, and if you ask enough people, uh, who are investing, you, you figure it out. This is not rocket science in some ways, right? Uh, the, if you ask me, I'll tell you, right? Uh, and and right. so uh, most, most VCs are that way. So um, the, the saddest part is an entrepreneur that actually has no idea because he didn't ask or she didn't ask, mm. right? Yeah, absolutely. And how sort of hands on is uh, is Monks Hill Ventures with uh, you know the actual portfolio company? You know, are they are are you guys very aggressive with sort of uh, trying to to leverage uh, non financial resources as well to help the growth of the company, or do you guys take sort of a more backseat and let them sort of uh, just use the capital to to figure it out their, themselves? If if we have to be hands too hands on. Uh, it means we screwed up on the investment. We shouldn't have invested. We need people <laughs> who could. The, the CEO that we invest in or the, the founder that we invest in, we want to see the potential of that person running $100 million a year business or more. Mm. So that's a huge right. business. $100 million in revenues is a huge business, right? Sure. Um, and, and we want to see you be able to do that. Sometimes we screw up in assessing people, in which case it's not much we can do because we're in the deal whether we like it or not. But right. um, but ideally, we don't have to do much, right? We, mm. we, we are board members. We, we sit on the board um, when we invest in a deal. So we will do at least what board members need to do. But the other thing we, uh, the other set of things we do is um, we, we like to think of ourselves as sort of thought partners for our, uh, our CEOs and our founders. Um, mm. We've been there, done that. I think that's the main differentiator uh, of the Monks Hill Fund. Um, right. There's only a couple of us uh, within Southeast Asia that have taken companies public, etc. So, so right. we can be very useful sounding boards because of mm. that experience and because we've built large companies and because uh, we've uh, we've actually we actually seen lots of different models, right? We, we've seen the U.S., we've seen China, and now we're seeing Southeast Asia. We see really the whole gamut of possible business models out there. Uh, so that's really helpful to entrepreneurs. Not to mention the networks and all, all that we provide there. But ultimately, we tend, and this is the lesson I learned as a um, the first time VC many years ago, is. The CEO is no longer you, right? No longer me. Um, right. You are a supporter. So stop telling the CEO what to do. 
giving them whatever they want you know, to, have, to figure it out. Right? If they want advice, you give them advice. If they don't want your advice, then you know, don't, don't need to give them advice unless you see them hitting for the cliff or something. Um, hey, it's a cliff. That's a... I want to know. <laughs> Uh, no, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and 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 everyone, everyone, every investor wants to protect their investments, so you can understand that side of it. But you know, at the same time, you know, you, you got to let the founder do his thing yeah. as well. So you know, that's... one one uh, very experienced VC said to me once, um, and this was in China. You know, sometimes it's better to uh, bite your tongue and let the CEO make a million dollar mistake and learn from it. Instead of let you know trying to stop all that, and then he doesn't learn the lesson, and then five years later it's a hundred million dollar mistake. Yeah. Wow! Yeah. So, <laughs> so it is tough. You have to bite your tongue while the CEO is making mistakes that cost money. Uh, sometimes, right? If it's below the waterline, <laughs> then you try and stop the hole from being formed. But uh, if it's above the waterline, you just let him blow the hole in the hull, and hopefully it doesn't cost too much to fix. That's a very sort of uh, uh, almost spiritual way of thinking about uh, it, but I, I like it. I like it. it. It might be spiritual. It might be spiritual, but you know, this is how money, big money, gets Absolutely. made. Also, one hundred percent. So I guess making money is spiritual. <laughs> yes, it is for many people. So, Peng, on the on the flip side of this, uh, maybe maybe you could uh, shed some some light or share some of your your knowledge and insight. Let's say I'm an investor and I'm looking into Southeast Asia, and obviously, uh, you know, like you said, there are very few experienced uh, investors on that that are doing what you're doing that actually have experience you know having exited and and know the, know both sides of the coin if if you're if I'm a, a VC that wants to come into Southeast Asia what what are some you know a couple of things that I should look out for what are some trends that you might see in the you know that you see in the next 5 to 10 years that maybe we should look out for yeah um so uh, i i think more important than trends uh because trends will change and technology will change trends etc uh is is actually fundamentally what you need to do so if you are an existing vc in some of the uh, ge geography you understand how to run a vc fund so what you want uh you don't need more people that understand how to run a vc fund what you want is uh are people who who understand the local scene. Uh, you, you want people that understand entrepreneurship. And so you try to figure out those people. And, and Southeast Asia is not one country, right? It's, it's a number of countries. It's not, it, ASEAN is 10 countries, but practically speaking, there's maybe four, five, six countries you need to, to really pay attention to in Southeast Asia. Sure. Um, and you, you almost need one local per region. Right, one in Jakarta, one in Bangkok, one in Manila, etc. Uh, right. Um, there, there is a uh, the the adva advantage of Southeast Asia is um, I think most countries, most cities are used to international businesses, so it's not as hard as China was like you know ten fifteen years ago. But the, there are lo lots of local nuances that you probably mm -hmm. don't understand coming in from somewhere else, and you need to have a local person working with you. And this is not a fly-in game. You know, in, in, again, in China 10, 15 years ago, the VCs would be flying in from Hong Kong, from, uh, from especially the Valley, and uh, that worked for maybe a year or two, and then it stopped working. Because you were not there to make the contacts when deal right. being made. Same thing here. That's uh yeah that's 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 definitely true and uh, you know like you said it's regardless of of sort of trends because those things change. Um, but you know the VC game uh, it might be nuanced in the different countries or the regions that you're in, but it's it's more or less the same. Now is there. Uh, I don't understand. I actually don't know, and I apologize for this. I should probably have, have known this before we spoke. But are you guys? Uh, do you guys raise institutional money, sort of on on uh, you know on a regular basis with different funds? Uh, um, so we are not a fund management platform, so to speak. Uh, we are a very mm -hmm. traditional Series A um, 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 management company, right? So we, we raise fund one, we deploy that. When we're about done with fund one, we raise fund two, and then we start deploying that. We're about to start deploying fund two in a few months, you know. 
uh, and then we'll do fund three, fund four. So we're not parallel fund managers. We're serial fund managers, if that makes sense. <laughs> right? uh, yeah. the, the difference, of course, if you're doing parallel funds, then you have different stages, different industries, you know, different specializations. And, you, and your skill becomes uh, finding fund managers as opposed to running the funds yourself, right? We enjoy right. Series A investing a bit too much to do that at this point. <laughs> yeah, you got Yeah, you don't want to be step away too far from the uh, the action. Right? Yeah. Um, is there, you know, and, and and you might not be able to answer this, or you you could choose not to. But is there any sort of portfolio companies that you're particularly excited about? Obviously, it's it's sort of the same question as as the children one uh, as your as your previous ventures. Or is there anything that you're you're working on that you're super excited about, whether it be a sort of a, a trend in Southeast Asia or or, or what have you? No. Oh, oh. One way to do this is we can talk. I can talk about some of our bigger companies, the more visible, mm. ones, right? So, uh, so that's not really discriminating in some. Well, it is in some <laughs> ways, but they're more visible. Like Ninja, Ninja Van, for example, is one of our first right. investments. Uh, uh, they are doing you know, more than a hundred thousand parcels a day now. You know, uh, in South wow. Asia, uh, it's a, like a four-year-old company, right? Um, uh, so it's a huge logistics uh, footprint across uh, Southeast Asia at this point, uh, and, and growing at a growing at a very very high clip. Uh, so that's Ninja Van. Uh, CADA just sealed a deal that will make them probably one of the top uh, credit type of agent uh, entity, um, and they're um, they're closing their next round of financing. You see announcements on that very quickly it's going to be a very very significant uh, financial player in the region wow pretty quickly nice. uh, and again we uh, invested in these two companies uh, within weeks of each other in 2015 yeah. right um uh, there are other bigger companies big companies also kk day for example based out of uh, taipei uh, but they are oh sure yeah yeah the southeast asian business is huge you know uh, they're uh, also doing large uh, revenues. I'm not sure if they've announced the numbers, so I can't. It is double digit millions, uh, uh, wow. and uh, excellent. So doing very very well. Um, uh, for a fund that is three years and and a month uh, and a quarter, uh, I think we're doing okay. <laughs> I, I think our, our everyone listening in would, would probably agree with you there, Peg. Um, so as we look to wrap up, and, and again, thank you so much for your time and sharing your, your insights and, and knowledge. Uh, and it's just been a fascinating hearing about your journey. Um, I, I sort of have two, two questions left. One of them, uh, you know, the second to last one is essentially, look, I mean, you've you've been on both sides of the corner, as we discussed. You've been a serial entrepreneur with very, very uh, you know, successful exits. Now you're an investor. If you had to give one piece of advice to a aspiring entrepreneur or maybe a, a startup founder right now who might be, you know, in Southeast Asia or maybe he's just looking to to emulate your success on your three companies, what would that be? Be clear about how you're going to make impact. Hmm. The, the, the lack of clarity is what kills a lot of businesses. You know, they're, they're fuzzy thinking. Right. And this is, you know, down to like apple pie, you know, but it is, you know, it is so important. That's, uh, you know, again, we're, we're going a little bit spiritual here, but I like that because, uh, you know, I think that at the end of the day, as an entrepreneur, you know, you have, there has to be a bigger reason that you're in it just besides the money and the fame or whatever, what have you, right? And so you, you said at the very beginning that the reason that you were doing these companies and then you started a fund was, was, was for the impact and the, you know, the, the difference that you could make, right? Yeah, but the fact of the matter is the world pays you well for having impact. Right. So, mm. you know, if so it, it goes hand in hand, you, you create impact, you get rewarded for it. So there's nothing you know, confusing about that. I, so, you know, be clear how you're going to make impact. The last question I have for you, Hank, is is basically, look, if I'm a startup that wants to get 
uh, in front of you uh, on your desk. Uh, or if I listen to this podcast and I just want to connect and learn a little bit more about Monks Hill or, or potentially, you know, uh, what, what you guys are investing in, what is the best place to, to do that? Um, well, um, we have a, a, a um, email address that you can send things to, uh, reach.us at monkshill.com, and it will be responded to, reach.us at monkshill.com. Great. And we will have that all linked up in the show notes. Pank, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you know, we really appreciate all the insights. Uh, obviously, you know, congratulations on your success thus far. And we're looking forward to, you know, reading about your exits in the future. Um, and uh, yeah, once again, just thanks for thanks for being, uh, you know, honest and frank and, and sharing your, your, your thoughts and your wisdom. So we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. All the show notes and links can be found over at jkimshow.com. Come back often and make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. Don't forget to join us next week for another exciting episode of The J. Kim Show. I'd love to hear your comments. You can find me on Twitter at jkimmer, J-A-Y-K-I-M-M-E-R. See you guys next week. This podcast is brought to you by Hack Your Fitness, the high achiever's guide to getting ripped in under three hours a week. If you're anything like me, you're probably working a full-time job or jobs and trying to find time to balance family life, social life, and last but not least, fitness. Look, I get it. I'm a full-time investor and entrepreneur myself and father of two. So how am I able to stay fit year-round without spending hours and hours in the gym killing myself on the cardio machine? After struggling for the last 15 years trying every workout and diet under the sun, I finally designed a system that allows me to achieve and maintain single-digit body fat for life in under 3 hours a week. Cardio not required. Head on over to hackyour.fitness and download my free 13-page guide that teaches you the simple science behind efficient fitness and smart nutrition and gives you everything you need to know to finally take control of your life. That's hackyour.fitness.